A few weeks ago, on a Thursday morning, I found myself in the middle of a chaotic routine preparing our two children for school. When the clock struck 7.30, the bustle was interrupted by the shrill ringing of the phone. Curiosity took over, and I wondered who could call at such an early hour. An unfamiliar code was displayed on the caller ID, further intensifying my intrigue. Hello, I greeted, carefully holding the phone to my ear. To my surprise, Claire, my wife, was on the other end of the line. Thoughts flashed through my head about why she was calling, as we had just talked the night before. Claire, who works as a representative of a small marketing firm, undoubtedly caught my attention. I take care of our children and work at home, while my wife is constantly on the move due to her work at a printing company in our city. Despite our different schedules, this arrangement suits us quite well, and we manage to earn decent money. Our cozy house in the suburbs has four bedrooms and a swimming pool, and we're lucky to have a large circle of friends. Claire told me that last night, when she went down to the hotel lobby to get a newspaper, her purse was stolen. Please cancel our credit cards immediately and ask for new ones urgently, she said with alarm in her voice. I've already informed Joy, my boss, about this, and she will arrange for new American Express Company cards to be sent to me by overnight delivery. Additionally, she will transfer some money to help me at this time. My wife said with alarm in her voice. This is grammatically correct, but it's smoother to omit my wife said as it's clear she's the one speaking. You're usually very careful about your stuff. Could you explain what happened? Unfortunately, I was a little inattentive and left my purse at the cashier's counter while I went to get additional literature. When I came back, it was gone. The cashier claimed she was busy with another customer and didn't notice anything suspicious. I also lost my driver's license, but the hotel sent employees to search in the nearest dumpsters. I hope they find it, otherwise, I may have to rely on a taxi to get to today's meeting. Don't worry, I'll deal with the credit cards as soon as possible. I apologize for my carelessness, dear. I hope that apart from about $200 in my wallet, we won't incur any additional expenses. The remaining cards can be replaced over time. Fortunately, most of my makeup is still in the room, so I'll be ready for the morning presentation. How are the children? I feel nostalgic for the time when we were together. Let me tell you about what happened about six weeks ago. Fortunately, I managed to cancel my credit cards before any unauthorized charges were made, but the wallet with the driver's license and other non-credit card items was not returned. So, I put it out of my mind, and life went on as usual. But I have news for you today. I noticed an extract from my wife's account at Fidelity, where she maintains a separate investment account for the inheritance she received after a tragic accident that happened to her parents a few years ago. I have always tried to keep this account confidential, but while searching for our home insurance policy, I came across a folder with monthly statements from her personal account. I remember that after the death of her parents, the inheritance was about $350,000, and I couldn't help but wonder about its current value. To my pleasant surprise, it has grown to more than $400,000. When I skimmed through the statement, my attention was drawn to the withdrawal of $3,000 from the money market account about six weeks ago. I wondered how she used these funds. I became very curious and decided to understand the specifics of her money market account. To my surprise, I discovered that she had written a check for a significant amount to a local jewelry store only a couple of days after she lost her purse in the same city. I couldn't help but wonder what she bought at that jewelry store. She didn't talk about buying something for me, and I didn't hear her mention buying jewelry for anyone else, although she has a brother. I couldn't understand why he needed a $3,000 gift. After thinking a little, I went to the computer and visited the jewelry store's website. I wrote down the phone number for further investigation. I grabbed the phone and dialed the jewelry store's number. A woman who introduced herself as a representative of the store answered and asked how she could help me. After naming myself in the specific deal I'm asking about, I explained that we had a problem with the purchase and I would like to know if there is a store warranty. She searched for the transaction on her computer for a bit and then asked me what the problem with the rings seemed to be. Rings? I thought, what kind of rings could she have bought? Fortunately, the woman on the phone quickly interjected, Oh, I remember this purchase. When the woman came to our store, she was visibly upset and said that her wedding and engagement rings had been stolen. 
she wanted to replace them, which turned out to be a difficult task as we were looking for suitable options that would satisfy her. She used the company's credit card as collateral and sent us a check a few days later. Now, you mentioned the problem with the rings. I want to assure you that our store provides a 90-day warranty for such cases. Could it be that the diamond setting has weakened? This is puzzling because she mentioned the replacement of the wedding and engagement rings but never indicated that she had lost them, only referred to the theft of her purse. I needed time to think about this information. Listen, I said to the woman on the phone, I need to discuss this with my wife first before making any further decisions. I'll call you back later. With that, I said goodbye to her. Although she looked somewhat confused, my own confusion was much stronger. It became clear that the ring should have been in her purse when it was stolen. But why would she carry them in her purse if she didn't want to hide her marital status from others? As far as I knew, there were no restrictions related to marital status at work. But if she wanted to appear unmarried in certain social situations, thoughts began to stir in my head that perhaps she wanted to enter into an extramarital affair while away from home. Just the thought of it instantly made my stomach sick. We have been married for 11 years. We have two beautiful children, Jeremy, 7 years old, and Melissa, 6 years old. I thought we had the perfect marriage and the perfect family. Our intimate life seemed full to me, or at least I thought so. Why would she seek an intimate relationship outside of our marriage? She traveled once a month, spending two or three nights in remote cities. If she wanted to engage in such an activity, she might consider it a safe opportunity. Apparently, the loss of the rings scared her a lot, and she decided to replace them with those that were very similar to the originals. I bought these rings with modest incomes, so they were not something extravagant, so getting a close likeness wouldn't be too expensive. She could have filed a missing persons report with the insurance company, but most likely, I would have found out about it. If the purse was really stolen at the hotel, she should have reported the incident. I couldn't help but wonder what she reported missing. I decided to find the hotel's contact phone number and called there. I asked if the hotel had any documents about the theft of my wife's purse. To my surprise, they confirmed that they did indeed have a written account of what had happened. I asked for a copy to be faxed to me and received it a few minutes later. The report was written and signed by Claire herself. In a statement, Claire said that her purse was stolen when she was dancing in the hall. She left her purse in the booth where she was sitting, and when she returned, she found it missing. It is interesting to note that Claire directly indicated her unwillingness to contact the police. As I absorbed this information, my thoughts began to race, overwhelmed by the consequences of what I had just learned. She deceived me not only by concealing the truth about the stolen rings, but also by inventing a story about shoplifting. Despite the fact that there could be some alternative explanation for this, my mind could not come up with anything other than the disturbing thoughts swarming in my head. It became clear that I needed to reveal the meaning of the loss of these rings, otherwise, they would continue to occupy my thoughts and drive me to madness. One thing was becoming more and more obvious, the rings were in her purse when she was dancing with an unknown man. Several weeks had passed since this incident, and in a few days, she had to go on another trip. I realized that I needed to gather more information about the route of her upcoming trip. I wanted to understand what she usually does in the evenings outside the house. If she entered into intimate relationships with other men, then perhaps the loss of the rings was a wake-up call for her, forcing her to reconsider her behavior. I understood that if I found out about her cheating, it would most likely be the end of our marriage. Although I didn't want to think about how it would affect our children, she was undoubtedly a wonderful mother. But I could not accept the idea that, in the event of our separation, she would have custody of the children, especially given her frequent business trips. My mind raced, desperately searching for any possible clues that might shed light on her devotion. What other information can give an idea of her actions during trips? Did she have unprotected contacts or insist on using contraceptives? I think she would prefer to use means of protection because she would not want to risk bringing home infections or the possibility of an unwanted pregnancy. In the end, after the birth of my second child, I had a vasectomy and pregnancy was out of the question. She could not count on the fact that the men she met would have protective equipment available, so she had to have her own supply. One question remained, where would she keep them? It is unlikely that she kept them at her house or in the car, so the most likely place to store them is the office. 
Most likely, she took them with her on business trips. I knew that she carried her business papers, laptop, and presentation materials in a large briefcase that she kept in her office. But if she had an early morning flight, she would bring her bag home the night before and then put it in a suitcase to go to the airport. This was the decisive factor. It was necessary to find an opportunity to search the briefcase before her departure. I was hoping that her next trip would involve an early morning flight. I made a conscious decision to stay calm and balanced without giving any signs that something was wrong. As it turned out, when the children returned from school, I was busy with various things, and I had almost no time to reflect on my suspicions. But the possibility of her infidelity continued to lurk in the back of my mind. When Claire came home from work, I got into a little mess while cooking dinner. A dish of beans slipped out of my hands and scattered on the floor. The subsequent chaos associated with cleaning, as well as the running of the children, led to the fact that I looked somewhat disheveled. Fortunately, she didn't seem to notice anything unusual in my behavior. At that moment, as soon as the mess settled down and everything was cleaned up, I greeted her with a kiss on the cheek as usual. We sat down at the table to enjoy dinner and, as usual, chatted about this and that. Given this usual routine, I didn't expect any suspicions about her upcoming trip. So, in a couple of days, you're going on a trip again? I asked. Yes, she replied without much enthusiasm. In general, everything is the same. I don't really want to. Curiosity made me ask further, if you don't like it, why don't you think about applying for another position? You have been working for the company for quite a long time and are well-versed in various aspects of its activities. I think you can adapt to almost any role. Her answer provoked a response from me as I understood her desire to gain more experience before switching to desk work, but I decided to gently encourage her. Conscience the kids and I really miss you when you're not at home, I said, hoping to make her feel guilty. And I know, I'm sorry, she replied sympathetically. I miss all of you too. Wanting to gather more information, I continued, So, where exactly are you going this time? Will you leave in the morning, and we can spend some time together before you leave? I followed her with a long look, not forgetting about our children who were within earshot. Although I tried to maintain the appearance of a normal state, my anxiety was obvious as my stomach was grumbling, preventing me from eating. She seemed to think that everything was fine because her reaction coincided with mine. I wondered if she was experiencing stomach problems but it turned out that she was eating without any pleasure. Perhaps my suspicions were groundless, but the desire to search her briefcase did not leave, as it could give me the opportunity to better understand her loyalty. I'm only going to Denton, so I'm leaving tomorrow morning at 7.30. I need something that will help me hold out until I get back on Friday, she remarked with a playful wink at me. I reciprocated, trying to maintain the appearance of normality. To my surprise, she blushed in response. Her statement that she had brought her briefcase home the night before she left meant that she would not go into the office before going to the airport. Given her outwardly sincere attitude to the upcoming trip in the presence of our children and me, it could be assumed that either she did not commit any infidelities during her trip or she was used to such behavior. I hoped that the truth would be revealed when I looked through the contents of the briefcase. The evening before the planned trip, Claire arrived home with a positive attitude, parking her car next to mine in the garage as she usually did. She looked visibly agitated, and for a moment, I couldn't help but wonder if her excitement was caused by the anticipation of intimacy with me or with someone else. When she entered the house, she did not bring the briefcase into the house, assuming that it was left in the car. Since I was busy preparing dinner, we sat down at the table, and she casually asked if I could pick up her suitcase from the garage when we finished eating. Of course, I replied, trying to appear unperturbed. Do you have everything you need for the trip? She reassured me. Oh yes, this is a normal trip. My briefcase is in the car, ready for the trip. I'll pack a bag with the essentials for a couple of nights. Wanting to maintain the appearance of normality, I asked, Do you have any plans during your absence? No, during the week, the children and I will stick to our usual daily routine. Maybe we can plan something family-friendly for the weekend, she replied, expressing readiness for this idea. Sounds great, I replied sincerely, wishing it. After we finished dinner, she kindly helped me clean up the table in the kitchen, and then loaded the dishwasher. When she was done, she went to the bedroom to pack her things, 
and I went to the garage to get her suitcase. Looking into the car, I did not find the briefcase and assumed that it was safely hidden in the trunk. Expecting this, I had already developed a plan to get to it later in the evening. Returning to the bedroom with her suitcase in my hands, I casually asked, where are the car keys? My tire seems to be slowly coming down. If I take her to the station, Jerry will fix her right away. She was confused for a moment, but then reached for her purse, handing me the keys. She offered an alternative, can't you just put in a spare tire? That's what it's designed for, for emergencies. Taking a firm stand, I replied, yes, the spare wheel is designed for emergencies, but we have enough time to fix it properly. I think that's what we should do. With that, I walked briskly back to the garage before she had time to think it over. I quickly drove her car out of the garage and drove to the junction station owned by my school friend Jerry. Stopping in front of one of the service compartments, I honked my horn to get his attention. Jerry noticed me and opened the door, allowing me to drive inside, and then closed it behind me. What's going on, buddy? Jerry asked curiously. I replied, they were supposed to fix my tire here, but I needed a little time to check something else. Sensing that I might have problems at home, he asked, problems at home, buddy? Maybe, I admitted reluctantly, opening the trunk and taking out Claire's briefcase, putting it on a nearby workbench. I opened it with a key. Jerry, realizing that a client was waiting for him, simply said, well, I have a client, so have fun, my friend. Nodding to Jerry, he headed back to the small shop attached to his station. I carefully began to search the briefcase, trying not to disturb anything unnecessarily. My hands explored the pockets on the lid, and to my horror, I found a package that caught my attention. When I took it out, my heart sank when I realized that it was an open package of contraceptives, with about three pieces missing. My worst suspicions were confirmed. I carefully put the package back in its place and closed the briefcase again. I put the briefcase back in the trunk and closed it just as Jerry returned. Did you find what you were looking for? What is it? He asked with obvious curiosity. I'm afraid so, I replied, and there was disappointment and sadness in my voice. Maybe you'll let me sit here a little longer, maybe you'll check the air in her tires so I can say I fixed the problem. Jerry looked at me strangely but complied with my request without saying a word. He really was a loyal friend. While he was checking the tire pressure, I drove out of the compartment and drove up to the gas station. I'm going to pour fuel into the tank. It was hard to say when I would ever do it for her again. In my thoughts, I thanked Jerry for his kindness and went back home. When I drove into our garage, my mind was clouded by darkness and the feeling of panic began to intensify. Overwhelmed with anger and frustration, I couldn't believe that she could betray our marriage, our children, and me like that. While my emotions were subsiding, I switched to planning my next actions to secure custody of our children. I needed concrete evidence of her moral and adulterous actions. Despite her shortcomings as a partner, I recognized her role as a good mother, and the children deserved to have a mother figure in their lives. Although visitation rights for the children would be allowed, my ultimate goal was to achieve full legal custody of them. She will have to explain the reasons for our divorce to her brother and friends. When I entered the house, I shouted into the bedroom, everything is ready, it was just a small problem with nails. Okay, thanks, she replied, still not quite ready to meet her gaze. In search of solace, I went to the kitchen for a beer, and then settled down in the family room with the children, who were absorbed in watching a TV show. About 30 minutes later, Claire came into the room and sat down next to me on the couch. By this time, I had already calmed down, but a deep sadness seized me when I realized that our once happy family would soon be a thing of the past. To my surprise, Claire moved closer and snuggled up to me, whispering in my ear, Are you ready for tonight? After taking a sip of beer, I replied, I think so, but I have a stomachache. Claire sympathetically replied, Oh, that's too bad, honey. Clinging to me, Claire said softly, I love you, and I instinctively put my arm around her shoulders, experiencing conflicting emotions. Despite her resentment and betrayal, there was still a trace of affection in her. I couldn't help but wonder why she did it, because of the thrill or because of the need for more intimacy than I could provide. I may never be able to figure it out, but what remained obvious was the destruction of my trust in her. 
we put the kids to bed together, and when she kissed our little angels goodnight, I couldn't help but look at her, knowing that by the morning when they woke up, she would be gone. But their little minds were already used to her frequent travels, so their anxiety was minimal. That night we made love, but there was no habitual passion in it, only a feeling of bittersweet farewell intimacy with the realization that our paths diverged. Sensing my distress, Claire asked anxiously, Is your stomach still bothering you, dear? I nodded and answered, Yes, but I can handle it, hoping desperately that she would prefer our love and marriage to the upcoming trip. I asked, Do you really need to go on this trip? Deep down, I wanted it all to be just a nightmare and disappear. If she decided to stay at home with us, she sighed and replied apologetically, I'm sorry, honey, but this trip is necessary. I will do my best to free myself and return home as soon as possible. I'm really looking forward to the weekend with all of you. With a heavy heart, I sighed and said, Okay, honey, it's time to get some sleep. You have to get up early to catch a plane. I'm going to take a quick shower now so I don't have to worry about it in the morning, she informed me. Okay, I replied. As soon as she entered the shower, I was seized with an impulse to examine her suitcase and find out what she put there. Although most of the clothes on top looked businesslike, I was amazed when looking deeper. I found a selection of her most seductive underwear as well as a small black cocktail dress in which she always looked irresistible. It became clear that during her absence, she intended to indulge in intimate pleasures, respecting her personal space. I carefully put all the things in their places, closed the suitcase, and went back to bed. I couldn't sleep that night, and when I heard Claire stirring around five in the morning, I stayed in bed, deciding not to say goodbye to her as was customary with us. I felt a mixture of fatigue and sadness. Bending down to kiss me on the cheek before leaving, she asked, Still not feeling well, honey? I nodded, unable to find the words to convey what was going on inside me. Hearing the sound of the garage door closing, I finally got out of bed and headed for the shower. I knew that the coming day would be very difficult. After sending the children to school and having breakfast, I turned to the telephone directory, looking for the services of a private detective on the yellow pages. The main criterion for me was to find an agency with branches all over the country, ideally in the place where Claire was going. I contacted several agencies and eventually found one of them with a branch in the area where she was going to come. Having arranged a meeting with them on the morning of the same day, I hoped that they would be able to provide me with the necessary information. Next on my list was finding a divorce lawyer. A friend spoke very well about one lawyer, so I found his contact information and called him. I made an appointment for the afternoon, hoping that this lawyer would be able to guide me through the difficult process that we were facing. Arriving at the private investigator's office, I discussed my concerns with him and arranged to monitor Claire on those evenings when she was absent. I provided them with a photo of Claire, as well as her travel route, to help find and identify her. They assured me that they would collect photos and compile a report detailing her activities as soon as her day's business was over. To ensure uninterrupted communication, they agreed to send information by email to their office in Denton and promised to prepare a detailed report by Monday morning. Satisfied with their promise, I made a significant prepayment as an advance payment for their services. They informed me that they might not be able to take candid pictures of their intimacy but promised that they would try to provide as many compromising photos as possible. I agreed that it would be enough. The meeting with the lawyer in the afternoon went according to my expectations. He explained that in our state, the principle of no fault applies in divorce, meaning there is no need to distribute blame. However, given that I am the primary caregiver of our children, it is likely that I will be granted custody. It was important for me to note that Claire would receive extensive visitation rights for children. In addition, we will divide our property equally, each side will receive 50%, considering our comparable incomes. Alimony will not be required, but since I will get custody of the children, Claire will be obliged to pay alimony. As for the inheritance she received, it had no meaning for me, and she had to keep it for herself. The main thing for me was the welfare of our children. I instructed the lawyer to prepare the necessary documents to hand them to Claire on Monday, citing irreconcilable differences. I also asked her to stipulate that she should vacate our house immediately after the delivery. The lawyer confirmed that I, as the guardian of the children, have the right to demand such a condition. It was decided that as soon as the children turned 18, 
the house would be sold and the proceeds would be divided between us. Leaving the lawyer's office, I felt a sense of satisfaction from the realization that life for me and the children would continue and Claire would suffer the deserved punishment for her betrayal. At that time, I did not take any immediate action regarding our finances, insurance, or other legal issues. I assumed that I would have enough time to resolve these issues after handing her the divorce papers. Given that she had inherited, I figured she wouldn't have to worry about her portion of our shared savings. When it was time to finish school, I went home to catch the bus. When Claire returned on Friday afternoon, I kindly offered to do her laundry, but she politely declined, insisting that she would do it later. I couldn't help but smile, realizing how mischievous I had been to tease her in this way. Deep down, I understood perfectly well why she preferred to do the laundry herself. It was important for her to hide her extramarital affairs at any cost. Later, when we were lying in bed, Claire expressed concern about my lingering stomach problems and suggested that I see a doctor. This has been going on for too long, she insisted. It seemed to me that I answered Claire a little playfully, informing her that I was planning to try a new medicine recommended by a friend to solve my lingering stomach problems. I expressed the hope that this would help solve the problem and bring her back to me. When we hugged, she whispered that she missed me very much. On Monday, when the kids left for school and Claire went to work, I got a call from the detective firm and was informed that they had a report ready for me. I informed them that I would be arriving soon, and within 30 minutes, I was sitting with the office manager discussing the details. The office manager informed me that a report with attached photos was faxed from Denton in the morning. He admitted that he had not yet had time to read the entire report, but with a cursory scan and a cursory glance at the photos, it seemed to me very incriminating. Taking a copy of the report from him, I began to read its contents. The subject of the report was identified as Claire Barton. According to records in the report, the surveillance of the woman began at 5.17 p.m. Wednesday, the 16th of June, in the lobby of the Denton Marriott Hotel. Her identity was established by comparison with a photo obtained from the office in Merrickville. Upon closer examination of the report, it turned out that she was wearing a company badge, which once again confirmed her identity. Further, the report described in detail the movements of the object. It indicated that she was carrying a briefcase when entering the elevator. A member of staff accompanied her in the lift and confirmed that she went into room 414 at 5.23 p.m. It is important to note that the report emphasized that the object was alone at that time. In addition, the report included a photograph designated as Exhibit 1A, which captures an object dressed in professional clothes before entering the room. When looking at the photo, it was clear that she was still wearing rings. Apparently, the photo was taken unnoticed using a mobile phone. The report stated that the employees rented a room opposite the facility's room. At 6.31 p.m., the officer received a signal that the subject had left his room and was heading for the lift. One minute later, at 6.32 p.m., the subject exited the lift and entered the lobby. The report noted that she was dressed as described in Example 1B. When studying Example 1, it became clear that Claire was wearing a small black cocktail dress combined with high-heeled shoes. In addition, she was wearing a necklace that I gave her for the 10th anniversary of our acquaintance. But the main thing that caught my attention was the absence of wedding rings on her left hand. There were enough details in the photo to make it clear that she wasn't wearing them. After leaving the restaurant, she went to the next room, where at 7.13 p.m., she took a place at the bar. Observers noted that she ordered a glass of wine. Shortly after that, at 7.17 p.m., a lonely man approached her with whom she briefly entered into a conversation. This interaction was recorded in Example 1C, where a photo of a tall, attractive man talking to Claire in a bar was presented. After a few minutes of conversation, Claire nodded in agreement and followed the man to a booth located next to the dance floor. The report says they spent a total of one hour and 43 minutes together in the cockpit. During this time, they engaged in intimate activities and even danced together on six different occasions. The photo labeled Exhibit 1D shows Claire and a man in a tight embrace, passionately kissing while sitting in a booth. The intensity of their connection was evident in the picture. At 8.51 p.m., the report recorded that both subjects left the restaurant. Then, they entered the elevator and went up to Claire's floor. 
The photo labeled Exhibit 1E captures the moment when Claire and the man entered her room, namely room 414. In the picture, Claire looks slightly tipsy but no doubt pleased with the events that have taken place over the evening. At 11.13 p.m., the man left Claire's room and left the building. The report included the license plate number of a car registered to Alexander B. Tate, who lives at 1424 Azalea Drive in Denton. It was noted that Alexander B. Tate was married and had two young children. As I continued to get acquainted with the rest of the details of the report, it became clear that Claire repeated her actions the next night with another man. The report was signed by an investigator from Denton. This revelation left me with a feeling of deep anxiety and resentment. It became clear that my wife was having a promiscuous sex life while away from home. I couldn't accept what she was doing. It was a betrayal beyond all expectations. The fact that Claire even lost her wedding rings didn't seem to stop her from being careless. After paying off the private detective, I expressed my gratitude to him and left. At the same time, I did not forget to take two more copies of the report recorded on a CD with me for storage. When I got home, I didn't waste any time and immediately called my divorce lawyer. I asked how things were going with the divorce papers, to which he confirmed that they were ready to file without hesitation. I instructed him to start filing documents and specifically asked that they be publicly handed over at her place of work the next day. The lawyer assured me that this could be done without problems and asked me to indicate her work address, which I immediately provided. My intentions were clear. I wanted to humiliate her during the trial. The idea of handing her divorce papers in the workplace not only satisfied my desire for revenge, but also gave me a sense of justice for her act. There was no intimacy between us that night. Claire seemed to sense that something was wrong and perhaps suspected that I had discovered something disturbing. Although she did not directly express her concern, she expressed the hope that I would get better soon. Strangely, she herself looked somewhat restrained, but I decided not to comment on this and ignored it. The next morning, I got up early as sleep did not come all night. I was busy working on the computer until I heard that the children were awake, and then I went to the kitchen to cook breakfast. After breakfast, I said goodbye to Claire when she went to work. She came up to me to hug and kiss me before leaving, but I responded with a half-joking hug, urging her to leave as soon as possible. At that moment, I felt that she guessed what was waiting for her. When I closed the door behind her, tears welled up in her eyes, and she whispered, I love you. When she left, I was overcome with deep sadness, and I wanted to give vent to tears, but I quickly pulled myself together as the children demanded my attention. I had to prepare them for the school bus. The phone call rang around 10.45 a.m., interrupting morning classes. When I saw Claire's place of work on the caller ID, I picked up the phone without saying a word. There was a short pause when the caller realized that I did not intend to enter into a conversation. In a whispering, trembling voice, Claire uttered the words, I'm sorry. Soon, the line went silent, and I immediately stopped talking. Claire didn't come home that night, and I wondered if she was continuing her deceptive game, not paying attention to her husband. Although I knew my anger was justified, I also realized that I might have been too harsh on her. The children, discouraged by the absence of their mother, wondered where she was. To cheer them up, I invited them to have dinner at a McDonald's cafe. By the time we got home after dinner, the kids were exhausted and went straight to bed. The next morning, Claire called with a request. Honey, can I come home and pack my things? Can we talk? At first, a feeling of guilt arose in me, but it quickly dissipated. Why don't you come from nine to noon? I replied calmly. Then the kids and I won't be here. As for our conversation, I made it clear that I would talk to her one-on-one -on -one in my lawyer's office, only after she signed, notarized, and returned the divorce documents. Then I'll listen to whatever you have to say. There was a sob on the line before Claire answered, good. A moment later, the phone went silent again. She signed the divorce papers, and six months later, our marriage officially broke up. It turned out that during the affair, she became pregnant. Unfortunately, when she tried to hide from her last lover, contraception did not work. Considering that it was close to the childbearing period, even if I hadn't found out about her cheating because of the lost rings, the truth would most likely have surfaced sooner or later. I heard rumors that she started dating again. If she ever comes close to a new marriage, 
I think about honestly warning her future spouse about her fidelity. It seems unnecessary to me that she should deceive and hurt another person. We had a meeting, and during this conversation, I expressed my thoughts to her in my lawyer's office. She begged me to reconsider the decision to divorce. She said how hard it was for her that she didn't have unlimited access to her children, but I explained that I just couldn't trust her anymore. Then she said that she went to a psychologist who diagnosed her with nymphomania. According to her, she asked for help and received support in the fight against addiction. She assured me that her urges were now under control. Despite her explanations, I informed her that this was not enough for me. Even if she claimed to be in control of her drives, the fact that she had not sought help earlier indicated a lack of active action on her part. If she had taken care of her cravings from the very beginning, she would not have found herself in the current situation. When I left the lawyer's office, she continued to cry. Having recently met my school friend with whom I keep in touch, he works in a nightclub. So that's what he told me. He saw my ex-wife at the club where he works more than once. Every weekend she goes there with different men, and she behaves cheekily. I was very offended that my children have such a dissolute mother. Probably my ex-wife never recovered from nymphomania. Claire's friend also called me and said that Claire was in a bad condition. She said that my ex-wife needed my help because she had contracted herpes. At the same time, she does not stop leading a promiscuous lifestyle. I sympathized with her, but I told her that I can't help her with anything, and I don't want to. Claire herself came to this lifestyle and to these health problems. I started dating again, and it seems like I found someone special. This woman is about the same age as me and divorced herself. She caught her ex-husband cheating and did not put up with such behavior. She has strength and resilience, which I really like. Even better, it seems that my children also liked her. It seems to me that this is a natural development of events, and it's only a matter of time before I think about taking our relationship to a new level. Story 2 Every Labor Day weekend, I am overcome with nostalgia for my late father. In our family, this holiday is of great importance because we try to honor his memory. Let me describe this scene to better understand it. As a teenager, I often lay on my bed immersed in the melodies playing from my CD Walkman from Sony, a sentimental gift from my ex-boyfriend marking our two-year anniversary. I can even remember what kind of melody played at those moments. The song Drive by the respected music group The Cars sounded in the headphones. It served as consolation to me at a time when darkness enveloped my heart, bringing a sense of hopelessness and uncertainty. Surprisingly, it seemed to me that the lyrics of the song seemed to be specially created for my personal experiences. The reason for my sadness was a recent unexpected breakup with my boyfriend, who was a famous football player at school. Our paths as cheerleaders intertwined for more than two years before our relationship ended prematurely. I had suspicions that he might have other girls because he had an undeniable attractiveness that fascinated many. But like most teenage girls, I was sure that it was I who held a special place in his heart. We exchanged sincere gestures, confessed our love to each other. A naive trust fueled my hopes. Looking back, I realized that my point of view has changed dramatically. It turned out that he was dating not only me but all the cheerleaders at the same time, taking advantage of his popularity as the most popular guy in school. All the girls craved his attention, they were drawn to his charisma like moths to a fire. I attribute my attractiveness to favorable genes inherited from my mother, and I believe that I have every chance to win him. But on that fateful day, I realized with horror that our relationship had come to an end. Our trip to Mexico for Labor Day weekend, which we had carefully planned and anticipated as a significant event, was shattered. The situation turned out to be incredibly awkward considering how much time we spent preparing for this event. This trip was of great importance to us because going out of state, and even more so abroad, was a promise that he made to me. I was excited to tell the details of my upcoming trip to Mexico to my parents, as well as to my two older brothers who came from college. Our family has long had a tradition of going fishing on Labor Day, but this time I retreated from it, looking forward to traveling with my now ex-boyfriend. I shared the news about this grand adventure with all my friends, using it as a means to show my worth and discourage other girls from harassment. Incredibly, just the day before we left, he dropped a sensation. He not only ended our relationship but also told about his relationship with two other girls. This made my pain even worse. Coincidentally, 
I was acquainted with the very two girls who eventually destroyed my world. They were aware of our upcoming trip, and their jealousy took the opportunity to seduce him with the prospect of a threesome, to which he meekly agreed. It was a heartbreaking, harrowing, and deeply treacherous experience that made me the object of ridicule and gossip. It was at this desperate moment that the movie Drive evoked such a strong response from me. At that time, my mother was 46 years old, and my father was 47. There were two older brothers in the family, 19 and 21 years old. Despite the absence of my brothers due to their college studies, we have kept a cherished family tradition of going fishing on Labor Day on the famous Big Lake in Lake Calcasieu, Louisiana. It is this reservoir that has been recognized worldwide as one of the main havens for catching trophy trout, an abundant and tasty species that lives in brackish southern saltwater. Our skillful hands easily caught huge trout weighing from 9 to 11 pounds. The art of fishing has become firmly established in our family tradition, having been inherited from my father. While my father, brothers, and I enjoyed spending time on the quiet water, my mother did not share such zeal for fishing. Mom, on the contrary, during our two-day absence, often preferred to devote extra hours to her profession as a nurse or indulge in various entertainments with friends. When I was in the privacy of the upstairs, fascinated by the melodies playing in the headphones, a sudden cacophony broke the calm. A unique sound quickly echoed in me, it was the hollow slam of our front door. She always made a loud sound when she was left to her fate, as her father had been going to fix her faulty mechanism for a long time. This unexpected and booming closing instantly brought me out of my reverie. Not knowing that my mother usually works at this time and my father is fishing with his older brothers, the house was empty. I heard an unexpected development amidst the calmness. I was met by the familiar and lively voice of my mother, radiating her characteristic cheerfulness and laughter. Surprisingly, her presence seemed to create a delightful commotion in our house. Curiosity got the better of me, and I carefully took off my headphones, deciding that mom was having a lively phone conversation. But contrary to my expectations, her melodious sounds mixed with a deep and unfamiliar male voice sounding in the background. Then it dawned on me that this mysterious voice did not belong to any of the relatives or distant relatives, which further increased my curiosity. But having plunged into a state of deep melancholy, I realized that I had neither the strength nor the desire to delve into the situation, so I decided to stay lying on the bed, not moving, and detached from the world around me. Although the content of their conversation remained unclear to me, I discerned cell vibrations accompanying the man's voice. Gradually, their conversation turned into a quiet whisper, until finally, the distinct sound of my parents' bedroom door closing was heard throughout the house. Located on the lower floor, this surprise caused a whole storm of alarm bells in my mind. A restless intuition overwhelmed me, creating a firm feeling that something was wrong and forced me to urgently begin research. A terrible suspicion came to mind, suggesting the unthinkable, perhaps my mother brought a man home, which I had never thought about before. The appearance of an unfamiliar male voice, as well as the arrival of my mother leading directly to my parents' bedroom, left no room for doubt about the situation unfolding in front of me. Even a person with a limited outlook could easily understand the seriousness of what was happening. But in order to dispel doubts and make sure that my own imagination had not deceived me, it was necessary to leave the bed and go in search of the truth with the utmost care. I quietly got out of my bed and tiptoed down the narrow corridor. My goal was to descend the stairs in complete silence, hoping very much to remain unnoticed by the unsuspecting duo. Every cautious step brought me closer to the unfolding events. As I descended with measured steps, the sounds of their intimacy became more and more clearly audible. Curiosity flared up with renewed vigor, forcing me to find out the identity of this mysterious person who caused such an unexpected and dramatic turn of events. Suffice it to say that the deep shock that gripped me was indescribable when their words were mixed together. Each syllable was like a merciless knife, mercilessly biting into the depths of my gut. Laughter and quiet conversations pierced through me like sharpened blades, making me perplexed by the reality unfolding before my eyes. My mother, whom I considered the epitome of high morality, was engaged in an affair with a complete stranger while my father was absent. This discovery hit me with the force of a hurricane, overwhelming me with a whirlwind of emotions, anger, sadness, and confusion intertwined, intensifying the storm of feelings raging within me. The excruciating pain was caused by the bitter feeling that I was the victim of the very betrayal that I hated, 
the very betrayal that deeply hurt me when my boyfriend cheated on me. The pain pierced to the depths of my soul, swallowing me whole. An irresistible desire overwhelmed me, forcing me to break into my parents' bedroom and demand answers to my questions from them, but fear clung tightly to my thoughts, paralyzing all my insides. I was tormented by indecision, driven by the fear of witnessing the moment when mom finds out that I was aware of their entire conversation. Time seemed to stretch out, turning minutes into an eternity that seemed endless. Trapped in my thoughts, I clung to the stairs, unable to escape from the grip of the harsh reality unfolding in front of me. The world I once knew had collapsed, leaving behind a fragmented family and irreparable damage to my innocent heart. The echo of my mother's betrayal resounded in my ears, reminding me that life can change in an instant, leaving behind only torment and uncertainty. The severity of this experience was deeply imprinted in the depths of my teenage consciousness, leaving a deep and indelible imprint. That fateful moment casts a shadow on my life to this day. It's hard for me to understand how you can confess your love for another person but at the same time inflict such deep devastation on him by committing an act of betrayal. When I was on the middle step of the stairs located next to my parents' bedroom, there was a feeling of approaching movement coming from inside. Further dissent was associated with the risk of revealing my presence if they quickly appeared from behind the door. In the era of the absence of videos on mobile phones, limited to simple photos, I made a quick decision. With the greatest care, I went upstairs intending to get my brother's video camera. Its ability to document events in real time would allow me to capture indisputable evidence of the truth unfolding in front of me. Taking the video camera, I carefully went down and began to record. Although the capabilities of the video camera were limited, it allowed recording weak sounds. I made myself comfortable, trying to remain inconspicuous but at the same time really hoping to capture the key moment when my mom and a stranger come out of the parental shelter. Time passed, the tension thickened until finally, the silence was pierced by the distinct sound of the door handle turning. My heart was pounding wildly. I tensed, deciding not to open the door. With self-confidence, they both left the house, apparently making sure that there was no one in it. And then, to my amazement, I saw his face and immediately recognized the man standing next to my mom. To my bewilderment, next to my mother was none other than her neighbor, a man of about 25 who lived two houses away from us. I remembered how my family and I exchanged friendly waves with him and his young children as we drove past their house. I could not imagine that behind this friendly facade there was an intrigue of such a scale. Anger rose in me, directed at my mother, and I could not help but draw parallels between her actions and the actions of my deceived ex-boyfriend. It seemed to me that she was repeating the same pattern of betrayal toward my father. When the neighbor left our house, I quickly climbed the stairs, intending to return my brother's camera to its rightful place and suppress the emotions raging inside. Unfortunately, Mom seemed to have found out about this commotion and went in search of its source. When I hurriedly returned to my brother's room, trying to hide the video camera unnoticed, an unpleasant turn of events occurred. Desperately trying to hide, I clumsily crawled under the bed, naively hoping to hide from her gaze. But my clumsiness was useless. Part of my clothes betrayed my presence, which made my hiding place completely meaningless. In the end, I crawled out from under the bed and saw a visibly frightened mother in front of me, her hand instinctively pressed against her chest, which indicated that shock could cause a heart attack. Curiosity, with a hint of concern, sounded in my mother's voice when she asked why I hid under my brother's bed and did not go on the expected trip to Mexico with my boyfriend. With a note of sharpness, I quickly corrected her, emphasizing that he was now my ex. At the moment of sarcastic sarcasm, I briefly told how I caught him red-handed in treason, as if drawing a line that indirectly hinted at her own undisclosed affair. Feeling her presence behind me, I rushed out of my brother's room, leaving an atmosphere of revelation in the air. My mother's attempts to convince me otherwise, to prove that my perception is wrong or incomplete, have changed little in my mind. To tell the truth, she remained in the dark about what I know and did not know. If I really witnessed the presence of a neighbor in a moment of vulnerability, she confessed that this man really was a neighbor. She hastened to emphasize that his visit was caused solely by the need to pick up an item and said emphatically that there were no unwanted contacts between them. But I was well aware that what he came for was far from an ordinary gardening tool, which contrasted sharply with the presence of my unsuspecting mother. Anger flared up in me at her brazen attempt to manipulate me, 
as if I was still a naive girl who could be persuaded by empty explanations. I, not knowing what to do, remained firm and perfectly understood the whole truth hidden behind her weak attempts to convince. With a sense of false victory, she left, believing that she had gained the upper hand in this deceptive performance. An annoying feeling began to stir in her that a carefully guarded secret could no longer remain a secret in my life. My mother, as a rule, has considerable authority and influence, and I cannot deny this. But it was the painful experience of betrayal and subsequent rejection by my ex-boyfriend that opened my eyes to possible betrayals from close people. When my father and brothers returned from a trip, they were surprised to see that I did not go to Mexico but preferred to deal with my relationship problems myself. During all this time, my mother did not take her eyes off me, doing everything possible to make her story about a neighbor's visit for some object be accepted as the truth. In the following days, my mother's behavior became unexpectedly attentive to both me and my father. But in the depths of my soul, I had already made a firm decision, I will expose her sins. Plunged into the darkness of my emotions, I redirected the boiling anger at my ex-boyfriend to my own mother, knowing full well what kind of heartache the betrayal of a loved one causes. About a week later, when my mother already believed that she had successfully managed to hide from the exposure of her infidelity, I took advantage of a convenient moment. After waiting for her absence from our house, I told my father the horrifying details of what I witnessed that Labor Day weekend. At the same time, I deliberately did not talk about the recordings from the video camera, wanting to rid him of all the evidence I have. It was never my intention to intentionally deceive or manipulate the situation. On the contrary, I sincerely believed that by telling the truth to my father, he would believe and support me, and my mother would eventually admit that she was wrong. Unfortunately, reality turned out differently, and this cannot but rejoice. My father met with my mother and told her about what I had told him, but to my horror, she categorically denied all the accusations, even to the point that she accused me of fabricating the whole story. At first, my father was on my side, believing my story, but my mother skillfully manipulated the circumstances. She used the recent breakup with my boyfriend and pointed out my emotional problems as an excuse to doubt my veracity. In a subtle demonstration of moral superiority, she suggested that I go to a therapist, subtly hinting that she occupies a higher position compared to me. In my mother's eyes, I looked like a mentally unstable person who needed to be placed in a psychiatric clinic just because I dared to tell the truth. To some extent, I could not completely refute her statement because the pain I carried inside me was deep, preventing me from reasoning and clouding my emotions. The violent anger that I redirected from my ex-boyfriend to my own mother only made the situation even more complicated. To make matters even worse, within a week of Labor Day, the news of my breakup spread through the school like wildfire. Even my closest friends joined in the cruel laughter, and I realized with horror that everyone I cherished had turned away from me. The presence of concrete evidence captured on a video camera became an important lifeline for me, not allowing me to doubt my own sanity against the background of the chaos reigning in the family. Unfortunately, even my father began to doubt the validity of my statements, questioning my authority. As a last attempt, a kind of desperate insurance, I decided to go into my brother's room to get a tape containing irrefutable evidence of my mother's betrayal. The exposure of her misdeeds should have been sufficient grounds for revealing the truth, but I never found out that my father continued to believe in her fictitious version until a few days later. During this period of uncertainty, my mother's behavior changed dramatically. Gradually finding out the truth, my mother changed her behavior, became rude, and subjected me to cruel punishment in the form of silent treatment. Quarrels became a frequent occurrence during which she constantly reminded me that my own actions were to blame for my breakup, hinting that trust in me was completely undermined. It was at this moment that I was struck by the realization that my father really succumbed to her version of events. When the opportunity finally presented itself to talk frankly with my father about what had happened, he circled around for a long time without directly expressing his disbelief in my story. A weighty doubt in his words hung in the air, but it was only when I showed the video, which is irrefutable proof of the truth, that my father's understanding finally crystallized, confirming the truthfulness of my story. From the realization that I had to go to such great efforts to make my father believe me, I experienced a feeling of deep sadness and disappointment. But on reflection, I realized the difficulties he faced with a wife he had always trusted, respected, and considered responsible, and a troubled teenage daughter going through heartbreak. 
it was not easy for him to reconcile conflicting versions. Sympathy helped me to understand the difficulties he faced in this situation. After reviewing the video, my father turned to my mother, presenting irrefutable evidence captured on video. It was a night that was vividly imprinted in my memory, filled with heated arguments and stormy emotions. My mother desperately tried to escape responsibility for her actions, constantly changing her version, never fully accepting the severity of her betrayal. Strangely enough, even in the face of obvious evidence, my mother continued to stubbornly deny her guilt, as my father informed me. But the father got to the point where forgiveness became impossible. In the end, my parents made the difficult decision to divorce, which marked the end of their once united union. As an act of transparency, my father shared a video with the wife of another man involved in this story, hoping to shed light on the heartbreaking truth. A neighbor and his wife decided to try to restore their marriage, but unfortunately, after about a year, they separated, resulting in their house being sold. Surprisingly, my mother decided to blame me for the destruction of the house, laying the blame on me and insisting that our former happiness was destroyed solely because of my decision to speak out and reveal the truth. To this day, my mother stubbornly refuses to admit her infidelity, accusing me of being the one who exposed her. Our relations, complicated by such deep betrayal, still remain tense, despite the fact that I have already created my own family. She is trying to reconcile and help my brothers and sisters, but these attempts were made too late, since help should have been provided many years ago when it was especially important. She holds a grudge against me for daring to tell the truth and hopes that I will eventually apologize to her. In her eyes, she feels like a traitor because of my actions, but during that critical period, I was going through severe trauma, and her actions only aggravated the already difficult path. Looking back, it can be assumed that some higher forces arranged the circumstances that prompted me to reveal the truth. After the divorce, my two older brothers had already enrolled in colleges, and I was the only minor in the family. I decided to live with my father, who gave me constant support and thanked me for the courage with which I discovered the bitter reality. But my mother and aunt stubbornly laid the blame on me, claiming that I alone had caused the destruction of our family and adversely affected my father's life. They also claimed that my father never remarried and tragically passed away at the age of 67 from a heart attack. Unlike them, my mother wasted no time and got married just a year after her divorce from my father. But my mother and aunt did not understand that I had a deep connection with my father, which allowed me to understand his true happiness. They mistakenly equated marriage with contentment in his life, but I knew better. I have seen from my own experience that the liberation of my father from marriage with my mother brought him a new joy that radiated from within. He could freely and uncompromisingly pursue his hobbies. He spent his days fishing, playing golf, and going on research trips to distant countries. I remember that during this period, he met only one woman, which testifies to the true self-realization that he achieved after the divorce. Although I cannot confirm the details of my father's personal life during his travels, I had a strong suspicion that he could communicate with women from other countries. Although my own knowledge was limited to his dates with one woman, I allowed the possibility that his travels around the world opened up opportunities for new connections and relationships. But the exact information about the extent of his romantic hobbies remained beyond my knowledge and assumptions. Story 3 Greetings to all I never thought that I would come to this, to seek advice from strangers on the internet, and yet here I am. My wife and I went through a joint life path of 10 years, of which we spent 8 years in marriage. We crossed paths in college, becoming each other's first and only partners. I sincerely believed that our relationship was unique and wonderful because of our common history, but it seems that this perception was solely my own. Some time ago, my wife started working at a new company. At first, it was difficult for her to find her place because of her closed nature, but thanks to my support, she managed to make friends with a group of girls, some of whom were single after a divorce or dating without marriage. I was initially glad that my wife had new friends, but I became more and more worried when she started going to drinks parties and other events that her friends were planning. I wanted to discuss this change in behavior with her, but at the same time, I didn't want to impose any restrictions. Unfortunately, this change began to affect our intimate life in the bedroom. My wife who usually did not initiate intimacy, either felt too exhausted or simply was not in the mood due to constant walks. Eventually, a new manager appeared in her company, whom my wife and her friends seemed to accept wholeheartedly. 
Gradually, my wife began to casually mention the new manager, even to discuss how he solved some issues seemingly unrelated to work. I began to worry about her infatuation with this man, and I expressed my concerns, but she didn't hesitate to say nothing. To my surprise, she started discussing the idea of an open marriage to spice up our relationship. This came as a shock to me because my wife had never shown such inclinations before and frankly was not particularly personal. At first, I refused her offer and asked if it was related to the new manager. She denied any connection but admitted that she felt she had missed out on a certain experience. Nevertheless, she assured me that she did not want to lose me and therefore considered an open marriage as a safer option. I warned her that she was playing with fire, but in the end, out of some naivety, I agreed to the idea of an open marriage. We established a number of rules, the main one of which was not to engage in intimate relationships with other people in our own home for a year. My wife went on dates, had one-night stands, and eventually ended up in some kind of relationship with this manager. On the other hand, my experience was limited to a few dates without any one-night stands. At some point, I felt that the love I once felt for her, those pure and uniquely innocent bonds of marriage, had disappeared, and it was tearing me apart from the inside. I found solace in the company of an amazing woman who recently moved from South Korea, and in the end, we went on an unforgettable date together. Our conversations flowed easily, and her wit and infectious smile left an unforgettable impression. We continued to go on dates, and soon an intimate relationship began between us. I have never experienced anything like the passion that was between my wife and me. This woman was incredibly giving, making me feel wanted in ways I could never have imagined. At first, my wife thought it was funny, but over time she began to doubt the depth of my relationship with my mistress. In response, I reminded her that this arrangement was her own suggestion. I also expressed my concerns about her own relationship with the manager. A heavy silence hung in the air as she absorbed my words. It looked like she had something on her mind, but she preferred to keep it to herself. Her behavior changed dramatically. She started coming home earlier to surprise me with dinner and carefully clean the house. She even came to my office to bring lunch and began intimacy in the bedroom. Under other circumstances, these gestures would have given me great joy but in the conditions of our open marriage, the responsibility for agreeing to which lies with me, it was difficult for me to reciprocate her. When I did get intimate with her, it was just to get it over with. Something in me had changed in relation to my wife, and I felt that she felt it too. I plucked up the courage and asked her what had led to such a change in her. What has changed? I asked, desperately trying to find an explanation for her sudden change in behavior. In response, she said that she wanted to show me that she loves me and is genuinely happy in our relationship. I couldn't help but laugh, feeling the irony of the situation. I went on to tell her about her circle of friends, about the manager she talked to, about her many one-night stands. There was silence in the room, and that evening she went to bed in tears without saying anything. The next day, when I got home, I found her waiting with a heavy heart. She confessed that she wanted to end the open marriage. She admitted that the whole experience was a terrible mistake and expressed deep regret about everything that happened. She begged us to focus our relationship on each other again. I asked her to be extremely honest with me and tell me about the true inspiration behind all this. To my surprise, she admitted that her friends had given her this idea. They told stories about their intimate adventures, which aroused her curiosity. When her manager stepped in, he surprisingly supported and encouraged this open lifestyle pushing my wife to further progress along this path. What started as an emotional connection eventually led to a physical romance once our marriage became open. She described it as feeling drunk, driving a high-speed car, a dangerous and reckless situation. At first, she was fascinated by this new way of life, but now the consequences have become unbearable. She realized that she didn't need a comparison, what was between us was truly unique and special. Regret flooded her heart when she realized the seriousness of what, in fact, ruined our marriage and extinguished any hope for a future together. In a moment of candor, I admitted that I might not be able to see her as my wife anymore. This confession shattered her, and she fell in front of me without saying a word. I just hugged her tightly while she cried, seeking solace in silence. Eventually, fatigue overcame her, and she fell asleep in my arms on the couch. In an effort to make amends, she took a bold step. 
she quit her job and severed all contacts with her friends and manager. She showed a sincere willingness to spend the rest of her life making amends to me and working tirelessly to regain my trust and become a real wife. But I still haven't broken off my relationship with my mistress. To be honest, my mistress allows me to feel like a man, gives me a sense of confidence and strength that I have not experienced in marriage for a long time. All this is compounded by the fact that in just a couple of hours, we have scheduled the first marriage consultation. I do not know how everything will turn out, but I hope for a positive result. At first glance, the therapist seemed pleasant and experienced to me, which gave me hope. The therapist seemed unbiased and sincerely willing to help us sort out our problems. Even though it was our first session, my wife took the opportunity to put everything on the table. She boldly admitted that the influence of her friends made her think about whether she missed any sensations. The fact that she was devoted to her first boyfriend and had no other romantic relationships made her wonder if she had missed out on the adventures that some of these seemingly amazing women had experienced. It is worth noting that although some of her friends were divorced, none of them were married. The therapist shrewdly noted that such a way of thinking can often be detrimental to marriage. A mismatch of experience and longing for what could have been can create significant tension in a relationship. My wife nodded in agreement, admitting that after the new manager started showing interest in her, some of these friends suggested that she consider this possibility. They saw it as an opportunity for her to explore and discover herself. Despite feeling guilty, she claimed that she had never entered into physical intimacy until one of her divorced friends suggested an open marriage as a kind of loophole. This friend convinced her that some couples really get stronger after such an experience. Unfortunately, my wife admitted that she persuaded me to an open marriage, which she now regrets very much. She called her so-called adventure intoxicating and all-consuming but devoid of genuine content. She began to realize that the connection she had with her adventure was nothing compared to the foundation that we had been building for years. Doubts began to creep into her mind, making her doubt the motives that prompted her to embark on this path. She saw the pain reflected in my eyes, and it touched her to the quick. At first, she thought that since I was dating, I would eventually accept her situation and come to terms with it. But everything changed when my mistress became a constant presence in my life. I seemed to start smiling again, even for no apparent reason. My eyes lit up when I received a text message or cheerfully left the room to answer a call. These subtle changes in my behavior led to the realization of how it affects our relationship. She admitted that she began to experience a strong sense of anxiety accompanied by frequent panic attacks for no apparent reason. Once again, in search of advice, she turned to her friends, but they brushed off her concerns, saying that my reaction is a completely normal phenomenon during our adventure. But it was at that moment when the very friend who initially proposed an open marriage said that my mistress seemed to make me a happy person, the harsh reality became clear to her. The realization that it was not my wife who brought me joy, but another woman, almost led her to faint. The seriousness of the situation affected her greatly, highlighting the emotional blow inflicted on both of us. She realized the stupidity of what was happening and turned to her friends with a desperate request to help her get me back. But in response, they callously asked why she opened her marriage if she couldn't cope with the consequences. It was at that moment that she realized how toxic and dangerous these people were to our marriage and the life we had built together. As a result, she set to work tirelessly to regain my love and trust, ready to do whatever it takes. For my part, I didn't say much at the consultation, but I told that my mistress continues to communicate with me. The consultant admitted that as long as my mistress remains part of the equation, there is no solution to the problem. Therefore, they recommended making an appointment for a consultation the day after tomorrow in order to once again analyze the complexity of our situation. The consultant noted the unusual approach to our long-term work as each other's first partners, which gave the impression that she was determined to help us overcome this turbulent period and become happy. I suspect she genuinely believed that any storm could be weathered with the right leadership and effort. Despite the fact that my report turned out to be voluminous, I wanted to give an exhaustive account of the current situation in light of all that has happened. I have decided to move into an apartment owned by my brother. Although he offered it to me for free, I insisted on a ridiculously low rent as I wanted to maintain a sense of independence. As I delved deeper into finding out the truth about my wife's behavior and the disturbing moments associated with her manager, disturbing discoveries began to appear during the second consultation. I decided to ask some questions. 
I asked if there was anything physical before the opening of our marriage. In response, she turned away, staring at the floor, and begged me not to force her to say the answer out loud. She reluctantly admitted that although it was not physical intimacy in the traditional sense, they were engaged in giving each other pleasure in each other's presence. This manipulator convinced her that since it wasn't physical, it didn't count as cheating. He distorted the situation by saying that they just appreciated each other's beauty in its entirety. The weight of her confession hit me with overwhelming force. I was speechless and completely shocked. She began to tremble uncontrollably, barely catching her breath from the surging emotions. Tears streamed down her face, snot flowed from her nostrils. She apologized for her actions. Even the consultant, stunned by such a revelation, feigned disbelief. My wife felt her knees and hugged my legs tightly, expressing her deep remorse. At that moment, she sincerely regretted the pain caused to me. Curiosity made me delve deeper into what caused her to change her attitude towards the manager. She told about one case when she began to move away from the collective as a whole. It was at this time that she noticed a change in his behavior towards her. One evening, leaving a meeting, she happened to pass by his office and heard him talking about her with another male colleague. To her horror, he expressed surprise at how easily he manages to manipulate her, noting that she is living proof that even the quiet ones cannot be trusted. When asked if he had sincere feelings for her, he replied that she was a pleasant but insignificant hindrance. This revelation further destroyed her idea of him. To make matters worse, the manager said that he was not going to break off the engagement with his fiancée. He heartlessly stated that his relationship with my wife is just a way to satisfy a temporary desire, emphasizing that he has a real connection and understanding only with the bride. He expressed a note of sympathy for me but said dispassionately overslept lost the realization that for this man, she was nothing more than an object of conquest. Dealt my wife a crushing blow. Coupled with the guilt of betraying me for fleeting pleasure, she was desperate, overcome by a sense of hopelessness. She left her workplace, finding solace in the parking lot, where she vomited, physically showing emotional shock inside her. In addition, with tears in her eyes, she said that at first, her thoughts were consumed with remorse. She doubted what she had done and asked me for forgiveness. She repeatedly apologized, expressing deep regret for the pain she caused. Curiosity made me wonder if she had a feeling of love for the manager and when her love for me stopped. Through tears in her eyes, she met my gaze and resolutely declared that she had never stopped loving me. Strangely, this revelation intensified the pain as it showed that despite her love for me, she was drawn to something else. Now she understands how stupid it was to take it for love. At the moment of realizing this, she unexpectedly squeezed my hand hard, which further emphasized her sincere regret and the depth of her emotions. She admitted her mistakes and longingly remembered the connection that had been between us before everything happened. Trying to reconcile, she even offered to move and start life anew together as it was originally intended. But I was torn, realizing that continuing a relationship with my mistress would be unfair to her. I explained that I needed time to be with my wife separately to sort out the complexity of our situation. Hearing these words, she experienced a severe emotional breakdown. Her sobs intensified, she began to utter incoherent phrases, desperately clinging to me as if afraid that I would disappear. It took me and the consultant some time to calm her down and restore a sense of stability to the conversation. When we got home, I started packing my things, intending to create some distance and clarity. But then a video call came to my wife's laptop, which abruptly disrupted our plans. It was one of her former friends, visibly upset and tearful. Shockingly, it turned out that after my wife quit her job, this friend had an affair with the manager. In addition, she experienced pregnancy, which forced the manager to change his behavior dramatically. This revelation showed how much his character had changed. Even more disappointing was the fact that this friend had a boyfriend with whom she saw a potential future. Curiosity seemed to be a constant topic, and she admitted that her affair was caused by a desire to get new impressions. It was a depressing insight that echoed the patterns we encountered throughout this turbulent journey. It turned out that her friend's boyfriend came across an email correspondence between her and the manager in which a possible pregnancy was discussed. In shock, instead of taking responsibility, the manager accused her of trying to trap him with a child. As a result, her boyfriend ended their relationship. In search of comfort and advice, she turned to my wife, 
believing that she had managed to save our marriage. But I could no longer accept this situation, so I turned around and left, finding refuge in the apartment where I have been living ever since. Important events soon took place. It turned out that the ex-girlfriend who survived the fear of pregnancy was indeed pregnant. Unfortunately, the stress caused by the loss of a boyfriend and humiliation due to infidelity led to the fact that she lost the child. This bereavement caused her a violent reaction. She became enraged and exposed the manager to the top management and his fiancé. Out of curiosity, I accidentally found his fiancé on Facebook and decided to take a look. When I found the manager's fiancé on Facebook, I saw that she represented the image of an ideal girl from a small town. In her profile, she was presented as a teacher for children with special needs who values the home and puts the family at the forefront. Suddenly, an ex-girlfriend who had experienced the fear of pregnancy contacted me. She said she intended to gather evidence against the manager and would like to hear my version of events in person. We both passed COVID tests to guarantee our safety. When I saw the pain written on her face, I instinctively realized that she was also deeply wounded and broken. Obvious signs of fatigue, dark circles under her eyes, and a red tinge of her eyes indicated that she was tormented by sleepless nights and haunted by her own thoughts. Despite her fatigue, she expressed gratitude for agreeing to meet and immediately offered sincere apologies for her participation in my wife's ill-fated adventure. It turned out that she was talking to my wife again, as a result of which she found out about my decision to move out. Instead of shifting the blame to others, she took responsibility for her actions. So she insisted on a face-to-face -face meeting. Appreciating her willingness to take such measures, I couldn't help but wonder why she was so determined. In response, she said that the loss of her child and the love of her life had led to profound changes in the very depths of her soul. This transformational experience has shaped her newfound sense of purpose. She admitted that she hardly looks at herself in the mirror. She is filled with disgust and self-pity. She couldn't sleep, she was haunted by the image of her ex's face on the day he found out the truth. It became obvious that this meeting was, to some extent, self-punishment for what he had done. She explained that communicating with colleagues was a clear violation of the rules of conduct, which was aggravated by his influential position in the company. As a result, there was a high probability that he would be fired and possibly blacklisted by the entire industry. At the same time, she understood that the same consequences could come for her. Despite this grim reality, she has come to terms with it, accepting the possible consequences that await her. After listening to my point of view on what happened, she thanked me again for sharing my story with her and apologized with a heavy heart. She left, carrying with her a load of remorse. While trying to pick up some things from our former home, I chose a time when I assumed my wife would not be present. But to my surprise, she was there, surrounded by our wedding photos and others, seemingly immersed in a contemplative state. As soon as she noticed my presence, tears flowed down her face. She tried to hug me, but I gently pushed her aside, indicating that I needed to focus on getting my things back. The next gesture she offered me lunch, but I refused, saying that I was not hungry and intended to do it quickly. Before I could continue, she said she wanted to show me something important. She took out her phone and saw a message she had received two days earlier from her former supervisor, which contained rude and furious words. Obviously, he used the new number to contact her since she blocked his previous number. My wife explained that she played a role in helping her ex-girlfriend expose him to the relevant parties, inspired by resources like Chump Lady and Marriage Builders. She believed that by revealing the secret, she deprived him of strength and gave our relationship a chance to fight. Although I expressed my gratitude to her for the courage shown in such actions, I said that it would not change anything in our relationship. I also mentioned my decision to stop marriage counseling at this stage. I told her that I would seek individual counseling instead to which she sobbed softly and expressed her understanding. Although one would have expected me to feel a sense of delight at her action or rage because of the prolonged turmoil, I, on the contrary, felt numb towards her, realizing that such an emotional reaction is not normal. I decided to deal with it within the framework of individual, not marital counseling, in order to ensure my own well-being and protect my interests. I followed my brother's recommendation and consulted with a divorce lawyer. At the moment, I am no longer ready to fight for the preservation of our marriage, and it seems that my wife feels this change in my position. Before I left, she made an attempt to initiate intimacy. 
When I rejected her attempt, she burst into anger, shouted, and asked questions about what exactly my mistress could provide that she could not, in a voice loud enough for the neighbors to hear. She said that she was ready to satisfy any desire or need of mine as a wife. I shook my head, deeply saddened by the fact that even after all that had happened, she still could not realize the true consequences of her choice. With a heavy heart, I calmly explained that if she still could not understand the consequences of her actions, then it was obvious that our marriage was going downhill. I left feeling the full weight of the situation pressing down on me. It became increasingly clear that my wife was beginning to understand the harsh reality and consequences of her decisions. Unfortunately, the sad truth is that we cannot turn back time and correct the mistakes we have made. Perhaps she can devote some effort to introspection and personal growth, striving to become a better partner. But it is unlikely that this change will happen in the context of our relationship because the damage done is already irreparable. What you can be sure of is that she will forever retain the memory of me and will feel deep regret for her actions. This feeling of remorse surpasses what many of us get from those who have betrayed our trust. Voicing my pain has played an invaluable role in helping me maintain clarity and perspective throughout this heartbreaking process. Infidelity really deals a crushing blow that leaves indelible scars. I sincerely feel that I will come out of this better and stronger than I was before.